Amen. Will you bow your heads with me for a moment? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your will. We ask, Lord, that your word would go forth with strength and with boldness. And that again, Lord, there would be a miracle of hearing that everyone would hear exactly what you would have them to hear this day. And as you do that, Lord, we will not hesitate to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory Do your name. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Well, it's been three months. It's been three months, and we've been going through the story of Joseph. And uh, for those who have been here the entire time, we started in Genesis 39, and now we're in Genesis 50, and uh, it's been quite a journey. Now, for those who are new and visitors, um, we're going to give you the recap, okay? This is like the cliff notes of, of, the, Joshua's, of, the, of the Joseph story, excuse me. Did I say Joshua the time before this? Okay, just making sure. <laughs> All right, but um, so basically Joshua, Joseph, I know, we just got off a cruise literally yesterday. We got, I'm still in cruise mentality, okay? Focus, focus, focus. Come on back. <laughs> Joseph was the 11th out of 12 sons of a man named Jacob. Jacob was the grandson of Abraham. Abraham is called the father of the faith because God makes a promise to Abraham that through his seed, all of the world would be blessed. And from his seed comes the nation and the people of Israel, and then ultimately our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And through Him, the entire world uh, is blessed. But Joseph is the, grand, the uh, great-grandson of Abraham. He was a favored child. Okay? We know that his dad gave him things that he didn't give other people, that he treated him with the benefit that he didn't give his other sons. And part of that was because his mother, Rachel, was the favorite wife of Jacob. So you guys remember that. And, and then uh, Joseph began to have all kinds of different prophecies that were going through his mind. He would get dreams where he saw that he was going to be great and that his brothers would be bowing down to him. And, and if you guys remember who were here, he, he did not hesitate to share that with his brothers, which always makes for a wonderful Thanksgiving meal. But uh, we find that because of that, they learned to hate him, and they literally sold him into slavery. So we have our first sort of up and down. Life is good, life is promising, and then bam, he gets sold into slavery. We find that he goes to Egypt, he gets into Egypt, and he prospers in slavery. That sounds like an oxymoron, doesn't it? How do you prosper in slavery? Well, he does. He ends up being a slave in a, in a particular official's house in Egypt, and he does well, and they give him authority, and they give him strength, and he's a person of integrity. And just when he's doing all this stuff, doing well, he gets set up and has to go to, do, go, go to jail for doing the right thing. This guy named Potiphar, who he worked for, his wife, had her eye on him. Okay? I know this kid's here, but you know what I mean when I had his eye on him, okay? That eye. All right? So she had his eye on him, and we find out that Joseph would not give in. He would not mess around with her. He would not disrespect not only himself, but also Potiphar, as well as God. He would do the right thing. And because he did the right thing, she set him up and had him sent to jail. So now he's in jail. So again, roller coasters, right? Favored slavery. In slavery, doing well. Set up. Jail. I mean, just when he just think it could get any worse, right? I was a slave, and now I'm a slave in jail. 
I'm trying to imagine, you know, even if you were like uh, a regular citizen in jail, that would be bad. But I'm trying to imagine it's probably a, a worse type of jail if you just had no rights at all. So he's in jail. We find that in jail he prospers. He does well in jail. So much so that they give him a little bit of authority, he becomes like the head of the jail folks. Right? And he begins to interpret dreams for people, and, and he's forgotten for a number of years. He gets an opportunity to interpret a dream of Pharaoh's, and he does so, and Pharaoh realizes that this guy has got the blessings of God upon his life, and he takes him out of jail and doesn't just like make him like a civil servant, right? But actually puts him in charge of everything. So, again, now here we have this sort of roller coaster thing in his life. Now he's in charge of everything. Egypt was the, uh, the, the ancient time equivalent of United States in terms of being a superpower. So this wasn't just like, you know, they, what, he was put in charge of like three mud huts and a well. Okay, this was huge. So here he is, and he's doing well. His family, who had abandoned him and long thought he was dead, we find out some 20 years later, end up having problems where they didn't have enough grain to eat, and they had to come to Egypt to get that. And unknowingly, they had to come to Joseph, the very person who they had sold into slavery. To make a long story short, Joseph puts them through a, a few little paces, but he's gracious toward them. And his love for his family ends up with this wonderful reunion where he sees his father and his brothers. They think that he's going to be mean and that he has the power to destroy them, but he doesn't. He just provides for them. He just blesses them. So he has this reunion with his, his family, and we find that his father, after that reunion, dies. Jacob dies, and they take him out, and they mourn him. They take him back to Canaan and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so now that's where we are. We're at the end of the story. Okay, sorry I had to sort of do that sort of quickly, but here's where we are. Genesis 50, verses 18 through 20. Now, keep in mind, Dad just died. So there's sort of a thought among the brothers that now that dad is gone, the real Joseph's going to come out. You know how like when you were a kid and you had to be nice to your brothers and sisters because your parents were there, but as soon as the parents left, <laughs> it's on now. All right? My brother, I have one brother, and most of you have met him. He's one year older than me. My brother w would do things like this. One time I was riding up the street on my bike. My brother decided to take a rock about this big and just see if he could throw the rock and hit me in the back of the head while I was riding my bike to see if it would knock me off the bike. All right? I guess uh, the budding scientist, that's the hypothesis. Take the rock against his head, will they fall off the bike? I just want to know. So he throws the rock, and it hits me in the back of the head, knocks me off the bike, right? And he's standing at the door of our house, and he's laughing, right? Because my, my mother had just gone around the corner. So I have, you know that ridiculous rage thing you get when you're like, like 12, and you're really mad, and you don't know how to control it? and you can't say anything, you just go, that kind of thing. Come on, you guys have been there. <laughs> I did that all the way home running. But the thing, well, my brother decided to barricade himself in the house. My mother had just bought a storm door. And for, for, for those who are not familiar with the 70s, you bought things like storm doors and, and things for your house on layaway. My mother worked a year on layaway to get that storm door. 
She was so proud of that storm door. She had just she put that storm door on. I came running in the house. My brother shut the door, and I just went through the door. Just bam, all the way through the door, holding the door the whole bit. So I tell you that just because my brother was still on the other side of the regular big wood door, and he said, ooh, mom is going to be so mad. And when you know, just in the nick of time, there my mother, who had the most impeccable timing, comes around the corner and just finds me with one leg through the door like this. <laughs> and when she came up and she was so mad, there was like steam in her nostrils. She's like, she's like, what happened? Of course, there's my brother. I don't know. He just got mad, and I don't know what's wrong with him. I've been trying to talk to him. <laughs> so, my, I, I, I'm a, I, I think I got whooped for three weeks. My mother would just look at the door and just like, where is he? Where, where, where? <laughs> and just start whooping. <laughs> okay, so I, I, I can imagine the things that went through Joseph's mind because what happened to Joseph was way worse than what happened to me in terms of getting back. But here we are in our story, and now dad is gone. So the brothers are a little worried, okay? Dad's gone. Now we're going to see the real Joseph. And this is what happened. His brother then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it. For good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Amen. He could have just said, yes, you'll be my slaves. But he had a better understanding, a better understanding of what God was going to do. And I believe that if Joseph was here and he was able to tell you in retrospect why he was able to come to this conclusion... I think you'd see a couple things. First of all, I think he would acknowledge that he was part of a big story. How many of you know that you're part of a big story? <laughs> Just Evelyn and Bob. <laughs> the rest of you? Hmm. <laughs> so, we are part of a huge, huge story. You know, I was, we were on the... Um, this cruise ship, and the cruise ship is, I don't know, what do we say, Matthew, 1,100 feet or something like that, or something ridiculous like that. And we were still on the sea, and on the map, we were supposed to be going between the islands of Cuba to the west and Haiti to the east. And on the map, it looked like you know, just a little bit of space that we would just go right in between there. So I thought for sure that you would be able to see other stuff when you went in between there. But when you went in between there, all you could see was water. It was just water as far as the eye could see. And Amelia and I began to talk about that idea that we are so small. Even the things that we think are big, like this huge ship, is very small in the economy of God. And sometimes we have to realize that what God has been doing from creation, God's story, that we're part of that, but we're a very, very, very small part of it. God is the star. God is the actor. God is the center. And we are the, the casted walk on. The, the people who come and go, who, who participate in the plan. But we cannot mistake with the idea that we are the center of the story. The story is about us. Joseph began to realize that. Now, I share that with you because I'm sure that in Joseph's life, as he's in jail, he wouldn't have been able to say, hey, you know what? This is part of a bigger story. I am so glad that I'm in jail because I know that this is going toward a better purpose. All right? He can say this in retrospect. 
Some of you are going through some stuff that you say, there is no way what I'm going through right now has anything to do with God's greater story and what God wants to accomplish. But trust me in saying that there's a bigger story. I love looking at Revelation when it talks about sort of the consummation of the great story. And it says here in Revelation 11, and this is a series of, of, of trumpet sounds, a series of seals that have been opened, uh, uh, you know, and, and we're getting this point where he's trying to tell us these things are going to happen before the sort of the, the consummation, the culmination of time. And he said, the seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there was loud voices in heaven, and they said, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. You see, God created our world, right? We know the story. You've heard the story before. Six days of creation, one day of rest. It was his. He made man to reflect his image. And that man and, and God dwelt together. And it was all for his glory. And we find out that through time, man breaks away. But through time, God brings it back. God brings back the kingdoms of this world to become the kingdoms of his own. That's the big story. And we can participate in that or choose to ignore that. But that's the big story. The big story is that God is reclaiming the world for his. He created it. We went away. He sent his son to bring us back. And that's the process that's happening right now. I want to give you five principles that I believe that if Joseph were able to talk to you today, that he would tell you that you need to understand. Because his story is our story. I don't care where you are. I know many of you have not been to prison, nor have you been in slavery. But I'm telling you, you're going to have ups and downs. You're going to have roller coaster rides. You're going to have great plummets as well as elevations. All those things are going to happen. And there's five things that I want you to remember based on the life of Joseph that will help you navigate this thing. Okay? The first thing is God has a plan. God has a plan. Have you ever been in the middle of something that feels so chaotic that you're just like, there's no way <laughs> that there's any kind of, this is just randomness. This is just chaos. But God has a plan. In Psalm 33, it says, The Lord foils the plans of the nation. He thwarts the purposes of the people. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. God has a plan. No matter what you're going through, and I don't know why I keep rehashing this, because I know that somebody needs to hear this. No matter what you're going through, understand that God has a plan. That God is able. That God's purposes will prevail. Secondly, God doesn't just have a plan for us where he has to decide, but we find out through, through our scripture that God has a plan for his people that's a pretty good plan. He says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Okay? Now, I know people have used this out of context. Okay? People have used that and they say, well, he has plans to prosper me. God wants me to be rich. So I'm claiming in the name of Jesus, this Mercedes E-Class, in the name of Jesus, I don't claim that. No. That's not what he's talking about, prosper. He's talking about thriving, to truly live, to have vitality, to live the fullness of life. That's what it means to prosper. And many people who are prospering today in that holistic sense don't have two nickels to rub together. He wants to prosper us. He tells us that he will protect us. He, he doesn't want to harm us. Okay? It tells us that he wants to give us a hope. God gives us promises. And then he has a future. 
You know, I am at the age now where I am no longer in the building up stage as much as I'm in the legacy stage. And for some people, that will make sense. Some of you, you go like, what? And that means that I don't have to prove anything anymore. I don't, I'm not trying to show that I am somebody. I'm not trying to, to, to prove any of that anymore. What I'm looking for is what are the things that I can contribute in this life that will last? What are the things that I give of myself that will make this a much better place when I'm gone? What have I given to my children that they will go and to places that I've never seen and never been? and project part of who I am and, and what we represented. That's a legacy. And God has a plan for us where he wants us all to be part, and to have a permanent part of legacy, that we're building on things that affect other people. I like this uh, idea in Genesis 50, the verse that I read, where he said that the purpose was to help so many people. Right? I think about all the Egyptians who knew nothing about Yahweh. And all of a sudden they're able to eat despite this massive famine. Why? Because a child of Yahweh was at the right place at the right time, equipped with particular skills to be able to do that, to be able to bless other people. God has a plan for you. And it is to prosper you. It's not to harm you is to give you hope and a future. And if you hear some other stuff, and people say it's from God, and it's not giving you a hope, it's not giving you a future, and it's causing you not to thrive, then it's not of God. One of the hardest things that we have to do as, as uh, people of God is discern the voices in our head. Okay? No, I'm not crazy. No, no I'm not. Stop. No, just kidding. <laughs> I'm saying to the, the point that sometimes we don't know sometimes the things that we're getting is that of God or is that my own conscience just wanting to say some stuff or sometimes even is that of the, the evil one. And we've got to be able to discern that. And part of this kind of thing is a filter to know the kind of messages that God will give you versus the kind of messages that the world will give you. In general, if it is against the Word of God, it is not of God. And that's why you've got to be in the Word of God. If you don't know what the Word of God says, then anything goes. can't tell you how many conversations I've had with people who say, well, you know what the Lord just told me. I was praying and the Lord told me, you know, I need to go do this or that and this or that. And it's in direct conflict with things that are in Scripture. And the hardest thing to do in the world is to try to tell somebody who's convinced that God told them something that God didn't tell them something. Right? Because as soon as you say God says it, end of discussion. You know? Well, God told me, yeah, that's it. We, we, we'll have a discussion because you've already convinced that God said it, so I can't show you in the, in the Word of God where it says that God doesn't do that. Secondly, he would say, God has a plan for you, and God's providence is real. Providence, if you look at that word, it's, it's easier to think about this as providence. As God, providence. His ability to provide for you in the midst of your journey, right? Joseph, I'm in slavery. I could die there. Nope, God took care of you. I could have went to jail and just rotted it. Nope, God took care of you. In the book of Deuteronomy, he was telling the Israelites, as they wandered for 40 years, he says, your shoes did not wear out, nor did your bellies get swole. He said, but I did that so that you would hunger and thirst. Hunger and thirst for what? For him. God provides you in your journey. I don't know where you are in your journey, but God will provide. Excuse me. People know the 23rd Psalm. 
But it's interesting to understand it in light of the providence of God. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. That is a great definition of the providence of God. God shepherding you. God giving you direction. God showing you where to go. Giving you the things you need. When you need rest, lying you down. When you need food, feeding you. Part of our, our misunderstanding of, of the providence of God is the providence of God gives us the stuff we need, not necessarily the stuff we desire. Sometimes we'll, we, we get confused because we think that which we desire is what we need. You know? Pastor of my status needs a Mercedes. I need that. That's just showing God's blessing. Uh, I, I joke about that a lot for those who are, uh, uh, who are visitors. One time, uh, when Amelia and I were planting church in Ohio, uh, we were worshiping at, uh, it was like a community center, and we probably had 30 people or so there, and um, we were doing all kinds of stuff, and there was a, a pastor whose son played football with Matthew, and the the, the, the pastor came in and saw it. He said, hey, I, I, I saw that you were driving that minivan. We had a Mazda MPV at the time. I can tell you a whole bunch of Mazda MPV stories, but we had a Mazda MPV, okay? And he had to tell me how God's blessings, that our church would never grow because there was no evidence of God's blessings because we drove the Mazda MPV. And that at their church, all the ministers, including himself, who was one of the assistant pastors, all drove luxury vehicles. And it was clear that the anointing of God was upon them. You know, and I, I thought, you know, that makes it so simple. I don't know why I didn't think of that before. <laughs> so, so, that, so next year, that's what's in the budget, you guys. <laughs> but it's just crazy. It's, it's vanity. It's, it's pride. It's, it's, it's all those things that are not of God. That is not of God. But God's providence is real. And I don't know where you are in your situation. I don't know if you, you're someone who's just moved here and you're trying to find things. I don't know if you're someone who's been struggling with something. Maybe there's a besetting sin. God is able to provide. And no matter what you need, God will provide it. The third thing Joseph would tell you is God's promises are certain. God had promised that through the children of Israel, he was going to bless the world. And it looked like, for the, for the most part, that that was going to end. Because it looked like the children of Israel were going to die in a famine. But through Joseph, through his connection in Egypt, because he was able to bless them, he became part of the fulfillment of this promise. Psalm 145 says, Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is faithful to all his promises and loving toward all he has made. If God promised it, he is faithful. Again, part of our thing is sometimes we don't know enough of God's word to understand what God has promised and what he hasn't. Sometimes God has made promises, but they're not to us. Right? We that a running joke that, that, you know, you meet the person who says, hey, um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm about to have our you know, 15th child. And you're going like, whoa, you know, you're, you're struggling to take care of those kids. And, you know, there's no van built that can take care of those 15 kids right now. Okay, so you might want to, and, you know, they'll say, well, you know, the, the Word of God says, be fruitful and multiply. That was God's command to us, and that's his promise. Well, he made that to different folks. He wasn't talking to you. <laughs> and you just have to understand, when we read in Scripture, that put everything in the right context, amen? And make sure that we take those promises, like the promise where Jesus said he will never leave or forsake you, amen? 
That's a promise that God has made to you. And in those times when the worst things in your life feel like that way, you don't feel that Jesus is with you. But He's there. And He's faithful to His promises. We memorized this a couple months ago. Right? So somebody should be able to just rattle that off. You're like, well, I can read it now, so I don't need it to... All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for the teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God or the person of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Why am I giving you that Scripture? Because it is the Word of God in which we find the promises of God. And when we begin to live according to the promises of God, we do what is called live by faith. And that gives us power. Joseph would then tell you it's not just that God has a plan. It's not just that God's uh, promises are certain, right? But he would also tell you that God's presence is the means and the end. God's presence in your life is the means and the end. W what are you talking about? We found out that every time that Joseph would go someplace, right, go someplace bad, he goes into slavery. What did it say? And God was with him. He would go into jail and it would say, but he prospered because God was with him. Amen. All right. It is the presence of God with us, in us, through us, that allows us to be able to live a life that is a blessing to others. And it's interesting because we find that in the end of time, going back to the Revelation, getting back to the big story here, that God's desire in creation was to be with mankind. And at the end we find He's with mankind. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. In the end time, in the, in the time when we're all together, when time is consummated, we are with God. He is the end point. Eternity, paradise, whatever you want to call it, is paradise precisely because God is there. Many of you know the story of, of Moses, who was leading his people, the Israelites, to the promised land, a land flowing of milk and honey. They were former slaves for 400 years, and now they were going to go to this really fertile land, and that land was going to be theirs forever. But we find out that they acted the fool. Right? They decided that they wanted to be disobedient to God. They decided they wanted to make idols. They wanted to do all those kinds of things. So we get to the point in the 33rd chapter of Exodus where, where, where God literally says, based on the intercession of Moses, he says, you know what? All right, I'm going to be true to my word. I'm going to send you guys to the land flowing with milk and honey. I'm sending you to the promised land. But he says, but I am not going with you. And I love uh, the, the, his statement in this. He says, lest I break out <laughs> and kill somebody. That's really what he says. Lest I break, because here's, and, and you guys, if you're a parent, you know this. You can love your kids, but sometimes you're like, look, I'm about to push to the end. I'm about to break out and kill somebody. That's what God was saying. And Moses' response could have been like, woohoo, hey, God's not there, but we are in. We made it, you guys. We are in the land flowing of milk and honey. I can't wait to see. Remember when we talked about them big grapes and stuff? Those who were at Joshua and stuff. All that fruit and stuff, man. I can't wait to get on that. He didn't. Because he ended up saying that it really wasn't worth going to if God wasn't there. The essence of of the land and the power of the land and the beauty of the land was because God was there. And I'm going to tell you now, the essence of anything worthwhile is if God in it. Is God in it? 
If God is in it, then it's worthwhile. That's why God's presence is both the means to get things done, but it's also the end. It's what we desire. It's what eternity is about. Here's the last thing that Joseph would tell you. It's God's plan for us to participate in promoting his peace. Right? God could have just blessed Joseph. He could have just blessed Joseph and just said, hey, you're the man. I mean, I really like you. Go on, have 57 children, make them into a nation, go ahead. Mm -mm. God's desire for Joseph was to be a blessing to probably millions. Because of his position in Egypt, he was actually able to bless the Egyptians. And I, I'm going to tell you now that many of the Egyptians had no idea about who God was. The idea was that he was giving his peace. Now, in, in English, we talk about peace as sort of the absence of conflict, right? We have peace if we're not beating each other up. <laughs> you know? That's what I said. Hey, we have a peace truce here. They're not shooting at each other. Right? But that's not the biblical concept of peace. The biblical concept of peace comes from the word shalom, which means thriving, wellness, wholeness, completeness. And that's God's desire for not only his people, but all of creation to live and fulfill its purpose. In John 20, 21, it says, Jesus says, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. We are to promote his peace. We are to be a blessing wherever we are. We are to be people who promote human thriving wherever the mission field is. For you, that may be your workplace, it may be your neighborhood, it may be in Rwanda, it may be wherever, wherever God leads you. You are to promote thriving, wellness, healing that comes from God. God doesn't just do it just so that he can make Pastor Amelia more well and more whole, but that, so that she may take his presence and go out to the neighborhood, go to Rochester General Hospital, go into families and be a blessing. I want to end this just with a recap. And I just want to challenge you, no matter where you are in your life, do you understand that God has a plan for you? Do you understand that you're not just here because you just happen to make a choice and this is what happened to happen to coincidental, but God has a plan. And it's a great plan. Do you understand that God is giving you providence the things you need, I will give to you. God loves our dependence upon him. Do you understand that there's some promises at work in your life? That God will be faithful to those promises in your life? Part of your job is to discern what those promises are. To get in that word, to understand that word, to allow the Holy Spirit to illuminate that word for you so that you can understand. It's important that you know that it's not just his promises, but it's God's presence in you now and for all eternity. That that is the means and the end. All of this is so that you will experience God's peace, and that peace will overflow wherever you are. God's got a great big story, and you're part of it. And through this whole thing, I hope that you understand, no matter what you've done, no matter where you are, God has created you for good. Amen? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much. We thank you for your plan, your providence, your promises, your presence, and your peace. And Lord, we just ask that we would be willing vessels, Lord, of your glory that we would have some understanding, a glimpse or an insight 
of the story and the role that you have for us to play. And Lord, we just take it an honor, Lord, that uh, you would even want to be with us and you'd even want to fellowship with us. Lord, bless everyone under the sound of my voice, Lord, that they would understand where they are. They would understand not only your story, but their own story. And as you do that, Lord, again, we'll give you the praise, honor, and the glory. In the precious name of Jesus, amen.